Welcome to the Underhive Workshop with Under the Hive of Madness. This is Goblin King, and I am going to show you how I make some terrain pieces with this series. The first one we're going to take a look at is this Connex box. I make a lot of these, building a Connex box table. So whether or not you need a couple of pieces for scatter, or you're like me and you want to make an entire themed table, kind of a shanty town out of these, that's what I'm aiming to do here. So here's a finished normal Connex box before paint. Hey, here's one of the options you can do with this one. I uh, started off making a normal Connex box, put open doors on it rather than closed doors like this one, and then I cut the siding open to turn it into kind of a little hut. And as you can see, if I want to put my little guardsman, little trader guardsman, either on top or underneath or inside, I can. So lots of different versatility to use with these guys. So I'm going to show you two different ways to do this both with my favorite material and just an easy to get recyclable material you can get anywhere. First off, I'm going to be using cardboard to make one version. This is just cardboard that you get from any kind of shipment that comes to the house. Get a couple of pieces because I know that I'm going to need a couple of pieces. Next off, we have gator board. Gator board is my preferred type of poster board. Uh, it's a little bit thicker than normal poster board. It stands up a little bit more. However, you can use normal poster board for this as well. A lot of times, and I'll probably mention it in other builds, the thickness of the material matters. In this particular case, all of this material is the same thickness, and it's the material that I've been using to build the other Connex boxes, so I'm pretty sure that they're all going to be consistent. However, just realize when you set out to fabricate something like this, thickness of the material is really important. For a little bit of the detailing work, we're going to use this one-sided corrugate that you can get off of Amazon. It comes in pretty big packs. It's pretty cheap stuff. You could, in theory, also take normal corrugated cardboard, get one side a little bit wet, and then peel off one piece of the backing. Um, and that gives you access to a corrugate that you could use for this detail, but there's a lot of cleanup work in that. As you can tell, I'm not even actually peeling all the paper off. So I recommend against it. This stuff's really not that expensive, and it's got a lot of life that it can be used and terrain building can be used as any sort of corrugated tin or corrugated metal that you need. You can also use it uh, in kit bashing. If you work on lots of orcs or whatever, you've got some corrugated tin you can use right off the bat. Next, probably one of my favorite materials to use is just this chipboard. Chipboard's used in a lot of packaging, especially here in the United States, but any place that has cereal boxes or chip boxes or anything. It's this chipboard. It's a very, very thin type of cardboard. You can also just buy chipboard. But again, I try to go for a lot of recyclable. I want to I wanna reuse as many materials as I can. So I'm going to try to hunt down the stuff that I know that I can just get access to. And these, you know, pretty much everything that we get here at the house that's uh, chips or cereal is going to come in one of these. So they're good to use. Lastly, for some of the detail work, you're going to need something round. So I've got a couple of pieces of this plastic rod. It's actually their refills for a 3D printing pen. Uh, you put them in the back of the pen, the pen heats up, and you can like 3D draw with them. They're pretty neat. Found them at Michael's for pretty cheap. You can also use Evergreen Plastics, makes a plastic rod. Any place that you can find plastic rod. We'll definitely talk about more plastic rod in a lot of builds. Very, very handy stuff. Uh, a lot like brass rod for pinning actual models. This stuff is find it buy it, stockpile it. However, again, if you're on a little bit of a budget or if you're unable to find those, uh, kebab sticks work really well too. Skewer sticks work really well too. There's just wooden skewer sticks that you can get at uh, the grocery store or the dollar store or whatever. Um, I've also seen these for sale at the dollar store. So there's obviously lots of different options. That's it for materials. Next off, I've got a plan. I'm going to go ahead and go over all the details of the plan so you guys know what it is. And I can also post up a picture of the plan somewhere at some point so you can get some dimensions off of it. But essentially, I draw out all the different sides. I prototype one. I prototyped one a couple of years ago. Um, and then based on that prototype, I drew these plans up. These plans just float around in my, pan, my plan folder. I've got a manila folder that just has a bunch of different plans in it. This thing's just floated around from Workshop to workshop, house to house, gets pulled out when I'm going to make some of these guys. But really important, kind of have a, an idea where you're going for. With all of these different little terrain tutorials I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce the plan and go over everything uh, in detail before we jump in. 
So for tools, one of the best tools that I think anybody can have in their hobby terrain building set is one of these metal square rulers. So this has a 90 degree angle on the outside and the inside. It's seven inches or eight inches on this edge and it's 12 inches on this edge. It's very, very good. I suggest getting these in metal, even though you can get them in plastic because not only are they good for using on terrain stuff, but if you have a house project and you want to make sure that you've got a trued up piece of wood, you've already got it good to go. I'm going to use a standard hobby knife. We're going to use a retractable quick blade. I like these a lot because you can break these off when they get dull. You basically get kind of an extended use if you want. Now I'm going to go ahead and use a white pen today on the gator board so it stands up a little bit better on the camera, but you don't need to use a white pen. You can also use a graphite pencil. When you're looking at it in person, you can actually see the graphite pretty well on it because the graphite's kind of like a dull gray versus a super dark black, but the white should stand out really well. And if you can find a couple of these white pens, they're not that expensive. Yeah, yeah. Use them. It's going to make your life easier. It's going to make your life easier. One of the safety things that I like to talk about is if you have the ability, go ahead and make yourself a blades jar. So this is a sharps jar or blades jar. This has all of my disposable, disposed of razor blades in it, exacto blades and razor blade pieces. It's just a, it's a supplement, vitamin supplement bottle. I cut a hole in the cap, put it on it. All of my sharp stuff goes in there. That way it's not floating around in the trash can, just sort of loose. It can't slice up the trash bag. It can't slice up my hand when I'm taking the trash out. Just a very, very nice and convenient kind of safe way to throw stuff away. For most of this tutorial, I'm going to be using a hot glue gun. However, if you don't have a hot glue gun, you can also use white PVA glue. I actually bought a couple of these little bottles at a store at one point, and I've been refilling them for years. So I just go out and buy the big like gallon Elmer's and refill it every time I need to. But these are really easy and handy for actually doing the application. Then you can just refill them with the larger bottle. The last tool, which is pretty optional, but I tend to use them as I've always got a pair of like needle nose pliers. These actually have a wire cutter part to them. And that's just so if I have to cut plastic rod or something really quick, I can. I can cut it down to size really quick, but I'll show you how to do it with a hobby knife. All right. So as I move through, I'm going to be moving little pieces, all the scrap, all the cutoffs, all the little things kind of to the side. I'm going to save all of that. And I'm going to save all of that for several different reasons. One, a lot of it can be cut down and turned into scrap that can be used in other projects. And we'll actually go over a rubble project soon. So uh, you know, any little tiny pieces of cast off of poster board or whatever can be cut down into smaller stuff that you can use for basing to any of the little pieces. I don't know when I'm going to be able to use them again or what they might work for. Um, you know, some of this siding stuff that I'm going to cut, some of the siding detail stuff I'm going to cut can be used for like cobblestones for Mordenheim or something like that. So, all right, so let's jump into making a Connex box. So as I mentioned before, everything's going to start off with a plan. I'm going to go ahead and detail out everything I'm going to mark on both the cardboard and the poster board before I do it. So I'm going to need two of these front and back pieces. So that would be the front piece that I'm going to cut into a set of doors. And then the back piece, which is just making up the back of the Connex box. Those pieces are going to be two inches on their height and two and a half inches on their length. Next, I'm going to need a top and a bottom. So that's going to be a bottom and a top. And those are going to be two and an eighth inch on their height. And they're going to be five inches wide. And lastly, I'm going to need two sides. So that's going to be two, time, two pieces at two inches tall by five inches wide. We're also going to need some siding detail, which we'll cut later. For now, we're going to jump into marking up all of our material for these cuts, the primary cuts, and getting all those set aside.
So it's always a good idea to go ahead and check a couple of your measurements. You guys will have seen me doing that as I was laying everything out, but there we go. We've got everything laid out. The white shows up a little bit better on screen, as you can see. Uh, I, I tried with the, I promise, I promise all my, all my marks are there. But I always find it a really good idea to label everything. That way I don't mess anything up. All right, so before we get into cutting, I wanted to go over something real quick cutting safety and getting a good cut with thicker material like poster board. So the inclination is to drag the blade through the material as like with as much pressure as you can, because you want to get the cut done in as few moves as possible, but you don't want to do that. And the reason you don't want to do that is here, I'll show you over here is if you put a bunch of pressure on it and you kind of try to drag it through once you're going to, you're going to grab the edge of the ruler like I just did. I actually cut into the ruler and I dragged it offline. So not only did I not complete my cut, but I dug into the ruler. Probably not going to hurt the ruler that much, but it is going to dull the crap out of the blade. And if you're not careful, you could actually drag through and into your finger itself. So the way to get a better cut, a way to get a better cut, cleaner cut, and a safer cut is to do multiple slow passes. That's kind of letting the blade do all of the work for you. The blade wants to cut. You don't have to put a bunch of pressure into it to make it do its job. It's just going to do it as it goes across. There you have it. Took a little bit longer, but I got a nice straight cut. This is a straight edge rather than being beveled to one end or being ragged as it moves along. I'm going to go ahead and cut out the rest of the pieces and we'll be right back. So as you notice, as I was going through all of my cuts, I put all of my cast off to the side. And there's an important reason for this. Even though none of this cast off is going to be useful in this particular terrain project, it's all going to be useful in the future. It can be used for all sorts of things. This can be turned into a base for some of these 3D printed things that I've got. I could lay several of them out and then kind of bevel cut it and do all of that and have a piece ready to go. Or it could just be small details that I use in something on the future. None of this stuff gets thrown away. It all gets kept. I had mentioned earlier that some of the smaller stuff, some of the stuff that doesn't necessarily feel like it has a place, still has a place, and that's in being used for rubble. So with this little piece of gator board, I can now go ahead and cut it up into lots of little tiny pieces. And either chop it up with a utility knife like I'm doing here, or one of the other things that I've found really useful and I've done in the past is I will take a big thrift store butcher knife and I'll just cut it up like I'm chopping vegetables and then I get this little tiny rubble and I save it in a container I use it later for basing it makes bigger pieces of rubble around a terrain piece or you can even chop it up a little bit finer and use it in smaller uh, larger pieces or smaller pieces like on a base for a miniature okay so now we have all of our primary parts assembled and ready to go we need to do one important step, and that is we need to find the centers of both of our doors. So 
Here's our two door pieces, and I'm going to find the center. Finding the center is pretty easy. What you're going to do is you're going to take a ruler, any straight edge, and you're going to go from diagonal to diagonal, and then you're just going to put a mark anywhere in the center. You can go from corner to corner, but you don't have to. And then you're going to flip it. You're going to go from the other diagonal to the other diagonal. There's our middle. There's our intersecting point. So I'm going to put a little bit of a mark there. Then I'm going to use the ruler's square straight edge to find that middle. And I'm going to go ahead and mark it. And then that becomes my cut. There, I got my two doors. They might be a little bit off. Nope, they're pretty perfect. Now, one of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be no gap in those. So you can either leave it that way. We can deal with it when we glue it together, or you can go ahead and shave off a little bit more now. It's kind of up to you. I'm going to go ahead and leave it as is because I'm probably going to do an open door on one of these guys. Cardboard, exact same thing. I'm going to put one diagonal line. I'm going to put another diagonal line. I know my center. Be a little bit more cavalier this time and just go ahead and cut it rather than measuring it. There we go. Another two doors. So I'm going to set those aside. And with that, all of our pieces are ready for primary assembly. So before we get to assembly, there's one important thing to talk about. There's one important decision that you're going to need to make. So you're going to take your bottom piece, which is your two and an eighth inch by five inch piece and a siding piece. That's your two inch by five inch piece. And you're going to attach them together. I'm going to use hot glue. Now, before you do this, you need to make a decision. You can do what I'm going to do, which is attach it to the side of the bottom plate. This is the bottom plate, or you can attach it to the top of the bottom plate. Now, whichever way you choose is going to change the overall height, the overall shape that you're going for. I'm going to attach these all to the bottom side of them rather than the top. One, I want a slightly wider base than I want a tall Connex box. And two, I've already made all of my others this size and I'm kind of going for a uniform look. So it doesn't really matter what you want to do. If you want to go for a little bit of variation, you can do one on the outside, one on the top. However, that works depending on how many of these you're going to build. However, you don't want to alternate. So if I do this, I'm going to end up with a gap. And that gap is going to be the thickness of the material. Now, sure, when I put the top on, I could fix that by offsetting the top as well. But then you're going to end up with almost a, a perfect square, which may have its uses, may not have its uses. But that's not what I'm going to want to go with. What I'm going to want to go with is I'm going to want to go on the bottom and on the bottom. And that way, when I drop my top in, my top is going to go like that right on top. So go ahead and glue both of these together. And then we'll talk about positioning the doors.
So as I mentioned earlier, you can use a variety of different glues for projects like this. I have a tendency to use hot glue when doing this main assembly step because I don't want to create a jig or create a complicated method of holding this stuff together while PVA glue is drying. I also have a, a very weird relationship with PVA glue. I, I like it for flocking and basing and adding detail like that. I absolutely hate it for primary construction. Probably the majority of the reason for that is that I've done a lot of fabrication in my life. I used to work in the signage industry, and now I work in the design industry for uh, toys and product development. And I just like having my result very quick. So I have a tendency to kind of go towards the super glues and the solvent glues and the hot glues. But anyway, so now we've got both of our boxes, sides, tops, bottoms, backs. They're all good to go. We're going to talk about doors. So the first thing we're going to do is we need some pins. Pins are not only going to give us something to hinge the door on, but they're also going to give us some sort of extra detail, something that starts to spice up the box a little bit. So really important to do here. This is just verifying it is two inches, so I'm good. Everything's good to go there. I'm going to verify that the cardboard one is also two inches. Look at that. All the measuring I did beforehand was good to go. I'm going to go ahead and grab one of my plastic rods here. And I'm going to find two inches on that plastic rod and I'm going to mark it. Oh, that's a swizzle stick. <laughs> I guess we're doing that first. So this is one of those bamboo skewers I was talking about earlier. So there's two ways to cut stuff like this. The first way is you just take your hobby knife and you roll back and forth. And as you roll back and forth, you will slowly cut it. You will slowly get down to that middle point and eventually it will come right on off. Now you can also obviously use like a hobby saw or something like that if you have one handy. Uh, let me get it all the way down. There you go. There's your two inch length. You can do the exact same thing with this plastic stuff. Actually works a little bit quicker with the plastic stuff just because wood's got grain to it so wood can be a little bit more difficult to cut if you're not doing it with a saw. Uh, again, I could roll back and forth and get my cut. However, I'm going to not necessarily cheat, but I'm going to do one of my shortcuts. And since this is a terrain piece, I'm going to mark this in white just because it's a little difficult to see. Since this is a terrain piece, and I'm not going to be super worried about little imperfections here and there, I'm actually going to use the wire cutter option on my needle nose pliers. It's going to go through it really fast. It is going to leave kind of a ragged edge, but I think I can deal with that. So I marked off four. Uh, two reasons, a couple of reasons for that. The main reason is if I wanted to go nuts, I could do reinforcements in all four corners. In this particular case, I'm just going to get us four door pins ready to go. So like I said, not the best way, but you can just take your needle nose pliers and crimp this sort of stuff, cut it really quickly. It does leave that ragged edge. You can clean that up with a piece of sandpaper if you really want, or you can lay them all flat next to each other and you can take a hobby knife and you can trim that little ragged piece that's on the end, or you can leave it as is depending on what speed you're going for. But just to show you what I would do, they're all good to go. They're all lined up. I'm just going to use my hobby knife to kind of trim that excess off. There we go. Good to go. All right, so now a little bit of the storytelling comes into play because now you can do one of two things. This can be an open box, a box that was open to be used for cover, or maybe a box that somebody's starting to turn into a home, or it can be a closed box. I'm going to go ahead and make this one an open box. So I'm going to pop my hinges on. We'll go ahead and make this, this other one, this uh, gator board one, closed. So I'm going to pop my hinges on here, this cardboard guy. You got to be a little careful with hot glue. Um, just, just remember it's hot. All right. So since we're positioning this guy, I'm leaving the hinges right there on the edge. We're not going to position this guy. We're going to do this guy closed. So I'm going to go ahead and glue the doors on like I was gluing any other side. I'm going to make sure to try to get a little bit of a gap in between just because there would be a little bit of a gap in between the doors. So I'm going to line up as far to the edge as I can without it looking super weird. 
course, at this point, if you wanted to, you could take your hobby knife and you could make a couple of little tiny parallel cuts in between to just sort of drive that separation a little bit more if you wanted to. Be careful where your fingers are. And then I'm going to take my hinges and I'm going to glue them on the outside. This way, I already start to establish a little bit of visual interest on the outside of the box. I'm nowhere near done with detailing it, but we've started the detailing process. Plus, that hinge isn't going to be exposed and open when it's on tabletop, so you want to you want to accentuate that hinge. If I were to trim a little bit and then put it inside, it works too, but then that hinge, that round portion that you're kind of getting with it's on the outside is going to be a little bit more inset. It's going to be a little bit harder to see. One of the problems with hot glue is you get all the little spider webby things everywhere, but you can clean them up later. So I just deal. All right. So here we go. We're going to position these doors open. So now that I've got my pins in, now that I know where my hinges are, I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of a bead here. And then I'm actually going to put this door completely open, as open as I can get it. Gives a little bit of interest, gives two different planes. So now you've obviously got cover here, but you can also have people take cover here. And then since the whole idea of this is that there's a bunch of these kind of in concert with each other on a table, instead of doing the same thing on the other side, I'm going to make it look a little bit more natural. Like it was thrown open. Maybe somebody was living inside of it. So this one has gone all the way, all the way out. And this one has kind of stopped. Now I could have glued it all the way back against here. I could have gone all that way, but I haven't detailed the side yet. So didn't quite want to do that. So as you can see, that pin's visible from that side, this pin's visible for this side, but that's kind of what you get if you don't glue it on the outside. You can almost kind of hide it if you just butt it up perfectly. It's not necessarily something you want to do. You don't want to hide any detail. Right, all right. so up next, we're gonna go ahead and put on the corrugate siding, the thing that kind of pops it and gives it that first little level of detail. So in order to do that, we're just gonna go ahead and check our sides, make sure that our measurements stay consistent. Because this material has a thickness, you can't just use the template anymore. Uh, you know, as, as tempting as it is to cut everything ahead of time. So we are sitting at five and a quarter on this guy. And we are sitting at five and an eighth on the smaller on the uh, cardboard guy so again the thickness of the material is something you have to take into account so it's always better to like remeasure measure twice cut once going back to that old saying so in cutting this material you have to make a decision and the decision that you need to make is whether or not you want your slats to go up and down or you want them to go side to side I prefer all of my slats to face the same direction. I think it gives it a better uniform look. You could do, you could alternate, you know, you could put them up, up and down on the sides and then sideways on the back, give it more of a slapped together or maybe recut, rewelded look if you wanted to. And I'm gonna go ahead and go with up and down. Now this stuff, you can use the channels to cut. It's a little bit of a trick if you want to, but I actually prefer to flip it over and measure, make all my measurements on the back. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut out all of my pieces.
so I had forgotten to mention it as I started doing it, but you also want to cut panels for the back and the front. So that's going to be that, in this case, that two by two and a half, because there is no thickness that's added to these. All right, so now I got a bunch of pieces cut that I can use to apply the detail to both versions, the cardboard and the gator board. Uh, as always, I try to save all these little extra bits. In this case, this stuff is really good for using as like overlapping extra plates of armor, or it could be corrugated tin. And you could use a couple of popsicle sticks or something like that, and make it into like a little metal bridge, or even overlap it like this if you're just trying to illustrate that there's like some rain cover or some cover from above or whatever. Um, so these are very, very useful on all sorts of different projects, not even just on this project. They can be used in all sorts of other terrain projects. So all my scrap goes to the side. The next thing that I need to do is I need to cut some siding pieces for this. So to cut the siding details, I'm going to use chipboard. Chipboard is a material that's used in a lot of like cereal boxes or cracker boxes, stuff like that. It's a very, very commonly used packaging material. Um, and the way that I'm going to do this is I'm basically going to cut eighth inch thick pieces. Uh, you'll probably have noticed a couple of times as I've been measuring or as I've been doing stuff that I've been finding a true edge and right, where I'll, I'll match stuff up. I'll see that there's some sort of irregularity and then I'll go ahead and cut off the irre irregularity. That's really important to do and just be mindful of, especially when you've got a tool like this or you've got any other tool that gives you a straight edge. Just check for those straight edges. Make sure that you're actually working with a true edge, a true 90 degree angle, or you could get some weird drift. Now, normally I would just use the ruler as the straight edge, but since these are gonna be relatively thin, I'm actually gonna do two marks. So I'm gonna do a mark at the beginning. I'm gonna do these marks at a quarter of an inch not an eighth, I think I said an eighth, I mean a quarter. So I'm gonna make several marks at a quarter of an inch right on the edge, just like that. And then I'm gonna come in a little bit. I'm gonna make another set at a quarter inch. I'm keeping true to this edge. That's the important part. Make sure that you keep true to at least one edge. And then I'm gonna come down even a little further and I'm gonna give myself a third mark. And the reason I'm going to do that is because then I can draw or lay the ruler down in a straight line between the three marks and I can make, go ahead and make my cut. Now, if you don't have a, um, an angle, if you don't have one of these square angles, this is actually how you would get your straight line. You would make three measurements and then you would use your metal ruler to draw a line through all of them. I would suggest at the very least you use a metal ruler. Problem with plastic rulers is if you do catch that plastic ruler, you are gonna shred the crap out of it and probably your finger. Um, same for a wood ruler. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and cut up a bunch of these pieces. these in pretty big quantities so I have a bunch uh, already made that I'll be using for the project but to give you guys an idea of what I would do with these oh that one's not quite cut through as again the the time for measuring things and like kind of pre-planning a bunch is sort of over because we're at the we're at the stage where lots of little cuts can be made and you kind of want to verify the length of everything on the material you're using. So in this particular case, I would lay out this siding piece and I would just draw a line right here at the edge because I know that's the length that this is gonna need to be. And then I'm not even gonna use a ruler because it's a super small cut. I'm just gonna make my cut. I end up with two pieces. This piece isn't long enough to go all the way across, but it is long enough to go this way or to go in between pieces. So after I've glued everything down, I'll actually have uh, 
or after, after I've glued the main sightings down, I'll actually have the opportunity to add more detail. So what I would do is I would save these to the side and they would be used on the inside to kind of make that nice little, nice little shape, kind of give you an idea. Again, you can pre-measure a bunch of this stuff, but at this point I, in the build, I usually am at the point where I'm free-forming a bunch. Um, any of the smaller cast-off from this material specifically is going to be super useful. If you're going to do like cobblestones or you're going to do like shingles on a building or something like that, I'm actually planning on doing a Mordenheim fantasy building build here coming up. So in that case, we'll probably talk, we'll come back to this material and I'll definitely use a bunch of that cast off. So any cast off that I generate again, I'm just going to keep and save for all the future projects. But we're going to go ahead and apply the corrugate. And then when we're done applying the corrugate, we're going to come in and glue on these side detail pieces. There's most of the basic build done. I've got my corrugate on the sides. I've got my siding detail pieces laid in. I've got my hinges. I even went ahead and put pieces on the bottom. Again, it just kind of bumps it up a little bit, gives it a little bit more authenticity, not authenticity, gives it a little bit more structure, gives it a little bit more detail. A lot of this stuff really comes into all of the detail work that you can put into it kind of cleans it up. It, it brings it just a little bit more and just a little bit more towards what you want. And as to where you don't necessarily have to detail the bottom, you know, detailing the bottom could be a waste of time or might not be the best use of your time when building a piece of terrain. It doesn't really take that much longer. And if you're going to end up on a table where something might be set on its side rather than flat down, or it might be stacked several high, there is a chance that that detail can be seen. Or you could decide to turn this stuff into some sort of modular building set where maybe there's one or two of them stacked on top of each other like this. 
or one used as a bridge, so that detail might come out a little bit more. At this point, everything else that I'm going to do to the build is extra detail. And the first thing that I'm going to do for extra detail is I'm going to add hinge details to the edges, and I'm going to add the locking pins that go on the front of these containers. And then I'm going to use some of this chipboard to lay in extra detail. So that's pretty easy to do. Go back to the rod or plastic rod, or if you've got access to, or if you're using skewers, those work too. So you mark out where you want it. And again, you can either cut this with a saw, you can do the hobby knife rolling method that I showed earlier, or you can cheat like I do and just use a pair of wire cutters. So I'm going to cut two of these, and I'm going to rough cut them again. And notice, as I've gotten to kind of these detail steps, I'm not super big on 100% going back and using the ruler to measure everything. And a lot of that is because I'm at the detail stage now. I'm starting to lay all these things down. The foundation, the part that needs to be 100% square is done. The rest of this is just, you know, detail and extra layering. Now, this stuff is great for attaching these little locking things to, these little locking pins to, because there's already a channel right in the corrugate. So I just lay some glue into the channel in the corrugate, and then I drop those in, I align them, and then I can come in with some of my extra pieces and just start making those decisions about where that extra detail I want is. Again, measuring on the actual terrain piece, I'm going to want three of these, so I can probably just use this piece as a quick guide for the others. When you see these things in real life, they're kind of welded together. So they're either 100% spot on or they've got all sorts of little tiny defects. So it really depends on how precise you want to be. I have a tendency to kind of want them to look a little bit more irregular. There's a couple of different reasons why. One of them is in this stage of the build, you're already starting to introduce a little bit of damage. You're already starting to in introduce a little bit of inconsistencies, which is going to help you in the painting stage. And the second reason is because then it gives that paint something to focus on. So if you do end up with a little gap or you end up with a little imperfection, you can damage that specifically. You can use that as a focal point for battle damage and then when you go to paint it you've already got a little bit more extra storytelling and that becomes important with the immersion side of the game nice thing about this stuff, speaking about battle damage, is it's relatively thin. So as you decide the story that you want to tell, you start making decisions, you can actually damage it pretty easily. I just did that by dragging my thumb across it. And this stuff... And an important thing to remember when dealing with this stuff is the damage that actually happens to Connex boxes themselves. You know, they get dragged along stuff, they, they bash up against each other, they fall off container ships. So you've got a lot of little kind of storytelling options that you can start doing. Obviously, you could come in with a you know pin vise or even the tip of your exacto blade and put in some bullet holes or whatever if you wanted to go that route. Uh, but I'm just going to kind of damage up the corner of this one. I'm going to make it look like something happened coming this way. So I'm going to just take my hobby knife and put some scratches and gouges in the chipboard. And again, the chipboard's relatively thin, so. You can kind of just carve away at it little by little. And sometimes it's not going to be super, super visually obvious when you're using it, uh, when you're cutting into all the raw material because you haven't put any paint on it. 
but any of these tiny scratches and gouges that you put in are going to be really, really noticeable when you hit it with like an inking step or a shade step later on during the painting process. Well, there you have it. I will go ahead and repeat the process here with my cardboard one to get a very, very similar shape. And once it's kind of at the same place, the cardboard one has a lot of rigidity, so you're going to be able to kind of manhandle it and kind of bash it around and dent it up just as well. It's not going to get any harder. I've got a little bit of a mismatch right there, so that'd be an area that I could really, really focus on doing some damage. Kind of cut away that corner a little bit more. Make it look like it was dropped, really, really impacted somehow. But yeah, that is essentially how I build my Comex boxes. There's some other detail that you can do. A lot at this point just comes down to the story you're trying to tell and the options. Ooh, I really like that. So see, again, that was kind of a mistake. I didn't mean to to damage or press it that much, but look at that. It it bent out a lot like a piece of metal would because it was all connected to each other. Kind of crunches up and bends right in the right way. Oh. Bunch of extra pieces of detail that you can do on these. I normally add a second support on the door. Kind of gives me an idea of where down is or where the top is, depending on how you want to look at it. The other thing that I do often is I'll build little ladders. Little ladders are pretty easy. Again, you're going to come back to this round rod material. You're going to cut it at the length you want, and you're going to come back to this siding material, and you're just going to cut your slats. And these were done with full-size slats, but obviously... You can cut down thinner slats, so you can have a little bit more natural or a little bit thinner looking ladders, but it just gives it a little bit extra. It gives it that, well, how did my how did my Space Marines get to the top of it? Well, obviously, they used the ladder. Another piece of detail you could add is you could add these stoppers to the top. You could add them to the bottom, too, if you wanted. You could do all sorts of things. It really just sort of depends on how much detail you want to put into these. Again, you could even overlap some of these extra pieces on top before you painted or anything like that, you can start telling as much or as little of a story as you want. Speaking of, the next part of this tutorial will be all about paint. Here's one that's all painted up, as you can see. However, if you didn't want to wait around for the tutorial, there is one important step you need to do before you slather these bad boys with paint. You need, you need to put something like Mod Podge down on these pieces. Now, Mod Podge is just a water-based sealer. It's like a glue and a finisher in one. You paint it on just like it's a paint. It's a little bit thicker like a glue, so you could water it down a little bit. What it's going to do, though, is as it dries, it's it's like a glue. It's like an Elmer's glue, so it's going to give you a nice solid finish. It's going to really lock everything down. It's going to keep any of these pieces from warping as you apply paint or any other effects. It's really going to give you a nice solid layer. The other nice thing about Mod Podge is on materials like normal poster board, it's actually going to do a little bit of the work towards getting towards this thickness that Gator Board has inherently. So you're going to be able to take that kind of thinner paper material, apply something like Mod Podge, and get a, a much more durable surface, a much more paintable surface. And that's really kind of the goal. If, so if you didn't want to wait around for the painting side of the terrain tutorial, go ahead and slap some Mod Podge on these guys, let them dry up, and then go ahead and prime them in your favorite color and do whatever your paint scheme might be. I will be back in a future episode to show you painting these guys, and part of that will also be going over my custom shade recipe, which I use to ink stuff, because using a bunch of Nuln oil to get this effect would be a lot of money. Thank you very much for joining us on this first terrain tutorial. I have been Goblin King from the Under the Hive of Madness podcast. New episodes are out every Wednesday. If you like what you're seeing here with this tutorial, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and ring the bell for updates. If you're interested in connecting to our growing community, we do have a Discord. Go join it. And if you would like to help the channel grow, you can help us at Patreon at patreon.com slash under the hive of madness.